I decided to take a different approach to this illness narrative and decided to incorporate it into a movie. A big reason behind why I decided to do that was because Amanda, who I was looking at, for her, art and film is an outlet that has helped her get through her illness and it, it has served as ultimately a coping method. And so what better way to learn about her illness and to portray it and try and understand it than through film? Diagnosis. Bipolar Disorder 1. Manic with psychotic features. She continues to be very manic with labile moods, tangential disorganized thought process, and hyperverbal and pressured speech. She has been beating on the doors and windows, yelling, threatening to assault staff. These were the words used to describe an 18-year-old Amanda Lipp in 2011. When people talk about their first memory, maybe it's riding a bike, maybe it's holding their dad's hand. Mine, unfortunately, was when I was taken advantage of from a young age. I think that played a really big part of um, subconsciously sort of going into, into adolescence and having insecurities and going through puberty and having sort of these mood swings that I couldn't quite explain. So it was about the middle of my, of my first semester at Chico State when I first had my, my mental breakdown. And, and the, the couple weeks prior to that, I hadn't slept much. Uh, I, I wasn't taking very good care of myself. I, I was stressed. And I had been experimenting with drugs a little bit and trying to cope in ways that, that were not conducive to my health or the environment. I, I dropped out of college. I spent around four or $5,000, I mean, all my life savings. I gave away most of my material possessions. It was my mind sort of just imploding after just years of just trying to deal and cope with a lot. Unfortunately, I've been put into this categorization of bipolar disorder. I don't regret the, the psychotic breakdown that happened to me because it, it gave me the chance to face my fears, to face my adversities, to face my story, and to further understand what had caused my behavior. Of course, everyone's breakdowns or illnesses are different. Mine happened to be such that it was very revolutionary and transformative in my, in my journey and in my story. Bipolar disorder is a mental illness that lies on a continuum where moods alternate between two extremes, depression and mania. Amanda's case is intriguing as it is uncommon to see individuals her age enter a psychiatric institution for such an extended period of time and return to a university setting. Following Amanda's journey, I began to notice a discord between her methods of coping and the dominant Western approach which is used to treat mental illnesses, the biomedical paradigm. Really difficult to, to deal with not only the condition and the stigma and the embarrassment and the shame of being sort of you know locked away so to speak one minute you're a college student partying having a great time living a, a you know a fairly normal life and the next minute you're in this setting that is completely foreign to you so a adapting to this new environment which is scary and b not having really people to talk to and relate to about something that you don't even know what's going on 
And that was the scariest part, was feeling so alone and so isolated in a place that is supposed to help you do the opposite and feel accepted and warming and, um, and welcoming. But um, the hospital was not the right setting for that for me personally. It was more of a means to just um, getting stable, getting on the right medication, and then moving on and getting well after that through the programs that NAMI offers and through my friends and family support. When I was very acute um, during the hospitalization and after the hospitalization, um, no affect. I mean, I couldn't cry, I couldn't laugh. The side effects of the medications were debilitating, but what's more debilitating are the side effects of the, the, the social side effects. Um, of the stigma, the shame, the embarrassment, the guilt, feeling like bipolar disorder is on my forehead, branded on me for life. I am defined by this. I am, I am constrained. You know, I, I am. This is who I am, and I gotta just deal with it. But learning that mental conditions can be a superpower and can be a blessing and not a curse, but you can use it as leverage to get things done in a manageable, healthy way, in a controlled way. So I have used my condition in that energy that bipolar disorder comes with and that um, and that sort of fun, um, you know, free spirit mindset that my condition, you know, allows me to be, and I say allows because I have sort of conditioned myself into accepting my, con um, my condition as bipolar and using it to strengthen the abilities and the traits that I already have. think of when um, I think of the hardest time was one of the side effects of the medication that I, would, that I was on. Um, it disabled motor function in my face, in my lower face. So I kind of talked like this, like I just got my wisdom teeth pulled out and it was like I couldn't really express myself and I couldn't smile. And I remember going up to my mom and saying, you know, mom, how can I be happy if I can't even smile? You know, how can I truly express who Amanda is if the side effects are not only, you know, the cultural and social side effects, but the physical side effects? And I thought, how could I, you know, but every day, wake up and just push that smile up, push that smile up and just believe in yourself. I think what got me better was just, just holding on to that tiny, 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 tiny bit of faith that I had that I could be normal again. Well, the goal of the institution, the institutional goal towards the patient was to, to reach a therapeutic dose. So how you reach a therapeutic dose is interesting and it kind of is hard to not get into the ethics of what a therapeutic dose means because it's sort of like drawing a generalization as to how we should act relative to each other because the way we define abnormality is relative to the culture that constructs normalcy in the first place. So you have these two sort of contrasting views while you're trying to become this normal person relative to the culture you're from. In doing so, you have to forego the, abnorm the abnormal characteristics that also got you there. But to me, that was sort of ironic in that in order to become normal or to be able to um, let your personality and your traits emerge in society, you have to accept the abnormalities that come with that as well. Um, and how we define abnormality, how we define mentally ill, how we define someone who's stable is very much a subjective, a subjective thing. Um, and so how I viewed other people within the hospital was very much relative to myself because, well, they're bipolar, well, they're bipolar, they're taking those meds, well, I'm taking these meds, they're acting stable and they're, they just got released, maybe I should act how they acted so I can get released as well. So it's sort of like, this, this observatory game that you play within this environment, it's sort of like a race to get out, and you're helping each other because the hospital staff, the psychiatrists, the doctors, um, the nurses, the social workers, the occupational therapists, all of the mental health workers are a team, and it sort of ends up being that they're a team and we're a team.
meaning the patients, the people who are being institutionalized. I felt that medication was holding me back from the truth. And the truth to me was not going to be discovered through a doctor, but rather through myself. And so I made the conscious decision to go off medication. Uh, about a year after I'd been discharged this was when I chose to go off medication completely. I weaned myself off, and this is not recommend, recommended for anyone to do by themselves, but given HIPAA laws and, you know, just sensitivity with not taking medication because it's frowned upon, uh, I decided to just do it myself. So that way I was the only person biasing my treatment. and. I had to prove to myself and gain the credibility of not taking medication before I could publicly announce, like, I'm not taking medication. Because as soon as I say, I'm not taking medication, everyone kind of puts red flags up and starts to notice things or attach meaning to things that are really just arbitrary. But with the bias of having a diagnosis, it sort of exacerbates symptoms that may otherwise not have been there. And now it's been almost, almost four years now that I've been completely off of mood stabilizers, any, I mean, every, any type of psychotropic you can think of. You know, I had to become my own advocate. I felt that the medication I um, was administered throughout the three months that I was in the hospital was not helping me, but just deterring me from understanding the reality, the real organic reality of what was going on, not just treating the symptoms, but the causes, meaning what, how did I get here in the first place? Unbeknownst to her healthcare professionals and family, Amanda embarked on a two-year journey of self-discovery and gradually weaned off her medications completely. Those around her attributed her progressive recovery to psychotropic drugs rather than the world of art she immersed herself into. Art to me is, is my voice when I don't have a voice. Art to me is the way I can uncover the layers of my mind and uncover the layers of the hardship that I'm trying to deal with. When I'm doing my layers of crayon, one layer of yellow, one layer of orange, red, purple, green, and then I etch away at these, these layers. And so these crayons provided this sort of, just this, this juxtaposition and emotion at least to where I had this very controlling environment uh, where I didn't have very many choices or control within what I was able to do and how I was able to think that these crayons, this medium, offered this sort of support system when I didn't have one that uh, really allowed me to express myself in ways that I didn't think were possible when I was so sedated and so medicated mm -hmm. on these drugs that were uh, attempting or intended to stabilize my abnormally perceived behavior, uh, hence the reason I was in this hospital in the first place. Oftentimes I found that the professionals that were around me didn't understand different languages. I see art very much as a language and how you communicate and express yourself um, at sort of like a subconscious level. And so I always found it very uh, disconcerting and disheartening in no sense when my art and the way I would express myself wasn't really up to where the standards of being normal were perceived. Because I do think on a very different, maybe relatively, a deeper level in terms of how achieved, I guess, mm -hmm. and within a very um, enclosed and controlled environment where you're essentially sort of a lab rat intended to be fixed in the best possible way, it, it kind of um, backfired in terms of exacerbating um, these abnormal behaviors that I had had um, to the point where I was there for such a long time that that became my norm. Uh -huh. This behavior became my norm. So crayons were very much an outlet that I could use when I didn't know how to express myself. And when I didn't know how to show or behave, I would resort to crayons, which looks kind of insane when you're thinking about crayons and how, <laughs> well, last time I used crayons, I was three or four or five years old, maybe. Uh -huh. um, here I am as an 18 year old. If I were to give advice to anyone who's suffering with a mental health condition or has been through a trauma or something adverse that they're having a hard time coming to terms with, I would suggest writing down your story, practicing your story, and, and, and tracing your own story and understanding where these points in your life 
we're difficult. We need to ask for help when we need help. We need to hold out our hand and offer our hand and support each other because we never know what's beyond those layers. I help myself through helping others and helping others discover their story, helping others find their voice has truly been the most therapeutic thing for me. And whenever I give a speech to someone and whenever I, I do my artwork and I can share that artwork and tell the story behind the artwork, it just, you feel it, you know, you feel happier. College-age students struggle with varying degrees of mental health distress or mental illness, but there is such a stigma about it that oftentimes they don't get help soon enough. A bustling college campus filled with 17 to 22 year olds. It is the age where mental illness often strikes first and hardest. There are more and more data um, that's suggesting that, that, that these are um, predispositions that are genetically ingrained that, that are basically beginning to happen at around the adolescent, young adult stage. Linda Lip is on the California board of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. She is the youngest NAMI board member in the nation and an advocate for mental health education. She was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when she experienced her first psychotic break while a freshman at Chico State. And she's lucky, quite frankly, to be alive. Since high school, Amanda's parents had struggled to understand their daughter's angry outbursts. When Amanda left for college, they thought they would eventually get a call from the police, a hospital, or the morgue. It was a perfect storm with uh, her age, stresses, stressors of going away. It struck me like a bolt of lightning. Wow, this is for real. And this is, she's, she's ill. I would say her recovery, the journey to her recovery, has been a combination of having that family support as well as being able to share her story. It seems that, um, from my perspective and opinion, that as she began to tell her story, maybe the first time she told it, she wasn't fully feeling better, but the more she shares her story, the more she's able to accept what has happened and understand it and tracing the roots to where this problem originated has also helped in understanding and her art has mediated this because through film, through documentaries, through her art, she has been able to reach out to other people and to discuss her illness and to help others through their illnesses. And so that, I believe, is what helped Amanda get better. Not the medications, but perhaps the medications, it's helped to some extent, and at least they, the medications did make her realize that something needed to give or to change, and that was when she had the risperidol and lost motor, function, motor functioning from her nose to her chin and could not smile. And so... While the medicines maybe did not have the intended effect on her that um, was hoped when she was in the institution, it did lead to her recovery somehow along the journey. Schlepper Hughes describes Nervoso as an illness that has developed as a result of society attempting to mainstream or standardize behaviors that are seen as abnormal or obtrusive to one's life. Similarly, bipolar disorder is the result of the biomedical paradigm attempting to understand one's mind through quantifying the mind through a strict adherence to criteria or classifications of disease that attempt to stabilize individuals through a categorical model. Oftentimes, the method through which people's diagnoses are made omits the individual's narrative or their perspective of their illness, thus producing an underlying self-stigma that propagates into the normal society thus producing a constructed perception of fear, stigma, and discrimination associated with the labeling of these behaviors. Through the biomedical paradigm through which behaviors are characterized, individuals perceive abnormalities or life story become weakness through which they identify with and may have negative repercussions. Ironically, this can exacerbate the illness themselves and can be counterproductive in medical professionals' attempt or intent of helping them become normal again. Is it that social illnesses such as nervoso become acceptable within mainstream society? 
Amanda has had to struggle with the stigma that comes with her diagnosis, and unlike the population that Schlepper Hughes writes about, Amanda lives her illness from an individualized platform that is singular in the sense that her illness has not been socialized, and she is more alone in her illness. The society Schlepper Hughes writes about is able to converse about their illness, nervoso, and it is commonplace to refer to their symptoms with this name. There is a stigma in Born and Nervoso because it was a name derived from a social disparity and poor allocation of resources to the lower class. However, because the lower classes choose to use this term for them and refer to themselves as nervoso, it deplaces the stigma. The author in this piece quotes a woman who says, My sickness is really just my life. My nervous, agitated, threatened life? Fraqueza is as much a statement of social as of individual weakness, for the people of the Alto are accustomed to referring to their home, work, food, or marketplace, as well as their own bodies, as fraco. The indigenous people are accepting nervosa as a term to describe their life struggles. For Amanda, her sickness is her life, and her life is her sickness. What I mean in that is that she has to be her own advocate with her illness, and in the realm of Western medicine, and the illness has been a life comprised of internal and external struggles that she has had to face. The regional communities that suffer nervoso similarly face internal and external hardships from social disparities such as suffering chronic hunger from too little food. Climate and illness narratives. There is a noticeable difference between my interview with Amanda and the News 10 interview. The News 10 interview used trigger words to describe her illness such as spiraling out of control, mood swings, angry outbursts, frightening, her illness is being looked at at what Kleiman would call a disease. The distinction between a biomedical approach versus a holistic, all-inclusive view of the patient, fam of the patient, including their family, friends, and doctors, and the journey of their condition. Kleiman says the difference between transcript and record interview and written medical notation is the difference between illness as the patient's problem and disease as the physician's problem. He is saying that the medical notation written about a patient does not include this holistic approach, and there are aspects of their story that is missing in the portrayal of their illness. To make this an illness narrative, you have to break away from the biomedical view of a disease and incorporate an all-inclusive view surrounding the patient and take into account questions that go beyond the physical symptoms of a pa that a patient has. At the beginning of the film, I read a clip of Amanda's diagnosis as summarized by a hearing officer. Diagnosis, Bipolar Disorder 1, Manic with Psychotic Features. She continues to be very manic with labile moods, tangential disorganized thought process, and hyperverbal and pressured speech. She has also been beating on the doors and windows, yelling, threatening to assault staff. This is just a physical description of Amanda at the height of her illness. It tells us nothing about what she was going through or feeling, nor how she got to where she is. Helping others help themselves really is my therapy. Um, it's my coping, is speaking up, sharing my story, even if it's hard to say, even if there is stigma. There always will be stigma. Um, that's not going away anytime soon, but I think the more people, it's like that pay it forward technique, the more people you can affect, and you, that one person you can make smile every day, that one person you can, you can make a smallest difference. If, if I can just do that once a day, then that's a great day.